mine and this one? Am I supposed to use which one? Oh, it's so fancy. They gave me a new iPad to do today. Uh, ah, does this work? Okay. Look at there. Open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Eleven oh nine. I love. Well, there's a lot of stuff going on up here. I just need this one now, right? I don't need this one. I'm gonna put this one over here. Move this one up here. Move the Bible right here. Okay. We're trying to figure out how I can draw something on the screen today and uh, get fancy, like a, like a school, a smart board. And uh, you guys are like, smart board? We had a chalkboard, and I had the job every week of every day of dusting. How many of you had the job to go out there and be like, <laughs> and, and hit those shakers, kind of showing my age there. And one of our jobs was to wipe the board down, and then we had to wash it, and then we had to clean that tray of chalk dust. and and everything, and then you'd fling it at your friend to get in trouble when you're disrupting class. And um, yeah, nowadays it's dry erasers and smart boards, and you can draw everything on a screen and reset it right on your tablet or a notebook, and, and the kids know less now than they knew when we were kids. I don't know. Um, hey, let's uh, start with the word of prayer for this series, and I because once I start, we're gonna we're gonna get going. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would bless this time, Father, that we would know you more that we would revere you more, that we would honor you, hold you in the right position always. Father, we ask that you would bless the young people, bless our nursery workers and those serving, and all of those that helped make today possible that aren't able to be here, whether it's sickness or traveling. Father, we ask that there would be a spirit of learning, that the Holy Spirit would teach us, Lord, that there would be comforting in here today. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I sat down with a couple of men and I was laying out my sermon schedule for the year, I looked at this called the seven seas of God's eternal plan. And, and I want to make sure you say you're plagiaristic pastor. Uh, yes, this comes from the Answers in Genesis thought process. The Creation Museum, they have the seven seas. Uh, they have simplified and they have taught this, the seven seas of God's eternal plan. And it starts with creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion, Christ, the cross, and consummation. And, and, and there's going to be a little jumping around. And when I first started looking at this, I'm like, man, we're going to do this in seven weeks. And we're going to finish on Easter. And we're going to talk about Christ and the consummation. It's going to be glorious. It'll be seven weeks. Because if you looked at your calendar between right now and Easter Sunday is only seven weeks. And, and you're like, this is, though that would have worked, but it's not going to work that way. Uh, once we started, I started studying. Um, I realized that there's, though we're not going to go into details and pull up uh, Lulio Giglio or Creation and Ken Ham and talk about simple things like uh, the bomb bombardier beetle or how a chicken comes or a giraffe and if their heart was just a little bit bigger based upon the size of their neck that literally they would explode their heads and it shows once again the beautiful creation of God's handiwork versus the evolutionist mindset. Uh, we're, we're not going to go that deep into the creation side but we are going to cover what this is. And we're going to take this, the purpose of this series just so you're aware, is to help to create and reinforce a good foundation of doctrine and Bible and belief into your life to ensure that we know what we believe and the importance of why we believe this. Uh, I am part of the community that if you don't believe God created the heaven and the earth, if you don't believe in the first uh, 11 chapters that God did all of this, then you're definitely not going to believe that God loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son for you. You will not believe that God can love you so much that he can forgive 
your sins. If you do not believe in God, you will not be able to believe in God's authority to say you have sinned against him. And you can only set up God in that such a high position if you believe him to be the author and the creator of everything. I will say that so many different variations, so have fun, creator, 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 depending on who I've listened to that week. Uh, so you have to make sure that we have the right position in all things. Genesis 1.1, and I'm going to read uh, quite a bit of a portion here. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and the darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, and that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I've already prayed. That's what I said. I want. I'm so used to the pattern. We just prayed. Let's dive into this. I gave myself that break. Look at that. Woo, I am so ready. Get going here. God is the creator. God created everything. And we need to make sure that we have this belief structure that God is the creator. And, and some people fall prey to something called intelligent design. And everyone loved the ID movement. They called it the ID movement. Who's ever heard of the ID movement? Intelligent design. Now, I started having a little issue, and I was so excited for the ID movement for, so, uh, for a while, until I started talking to um, other people, different cultures and backgrounds, and realizing that they too were excited for the ID movement because they thought it pointed to their God. Their God. And, and, and when you look at creation, it's very important that we have the right perspective of things. Uh, intelligent design can point, uh, sometimes we, we, it was the foundation of pointing people towards Christ or towards God, but it quickly became, became corrupted. And I have this expression, and some people say, that's probably not right, 100%, but I say, many times the devil will trick us with something good to prevent us from something great. And, and, and we had something so close to the truth, but something similar is not the same. Uh, it's very, very important. My wife has learned this example. We don't buy off-brand moose tracks. A and uh, I am from Michigan, uh, and in Michigan we eat moose tracks, and there better be a moose on the side of that carton, and it says moose tracks. Uh, I don't want bunny. I don't want uh, peanut trails. I don't want chocolate peanut butter nut trails. We want moose tracks. A and uh, if you know, you know. And some of you are the same way with Oreos. You don't buy off-brand Oreos, you buy real Oreos. You don't get something that's not the same. I want real mega stuffed Oreos because at the right ratio, you can dip it in milk for about seven seconds and it's a miracle in your mouth. And you know this, it doesn't taste the same if you buy those off-brand. It's harder, it doesn't absorb right. But the devil, and you'll find this when we talk about corruption, the devil will put a question mark where God put a period. And when we say God created, and people say intelligent design, I also have to remind you, I'm going to show my age here. This is a mid-2000 thing. This guy. How many of you guys remember this guy? Aliens. From the History Channel, he would teach all about ancient monuments and all these different things and point towards aliens. And there are people out there that believe that we exist today because aliens somehow planted us here on this earth and, and that we are a byproduct of a higher intelligent from aliens who are obviously billions of years older and more advanced in civilization and have completely forgot to check up on us since they left us here and, and to make sure that we've learned how to like you know renewable energy and lower costs and I don't know uh, things like that but it's so important that we talk about in the beginning God when you say I am a creationist it changes everyone's view at you because you are saying I believe in Jehovah God the God of the Hebrews the God of the Bible that in six literal days he created everything 
and, and that he created the earth aged. And people were like, how can you prove that? I said, well, if you look back in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, we say, but as by faith, faith that we believe that he formed the world. And you have to accept this by faith. Now, uh, many people will say, well, evolution, evolution, and this is where we're not going to get into the details, would go so deep, the probability of evolution happening becomes so large that it's a number that I can't comprehend. Some of you have had some medical procedures done in your body and you learned more about the human anatomy. The heart, the gut, the intestines, the brain, the cells and everything. And, and, and they're like, hey, we're gonna do a procedure on your heart. You're like, okay, so we'll be cutting right here. Oh no, no, we're gonna go in through a vein in the back of your leg and go up and we're gonna get to the heart that way and we're gonna do these things and we're gonna go over here and this and, and oh, there's something wrong with your, your ducts and we're gonna go right over here through the side and we're just gonna cut right through and, and, and it's amazing how the whole body works together and you see these things and, and the probability of all this developing is so large that you have a better chance of winning the lotto 15 times in your lifespan than it happening. It's huge. You, you, and that number is so big, like the chance of winning the lotto are nearly impossible. It's so large. Actually, it's even bigger. It's like a thousand times in your lifespan, which is almost, because that's impossible. It, the probability is ridiculous of that from a logical viewpoint. But we are going to look at this as God created. And I want to draw something. All right, this is where it's going to get tricky. I bring this down, right, like this, and Jerry's going to laugh at me. In the very first chapter of this passage, we have the origin or the powerfulness of God mentioned in one thing. And a lot of people, pencil, do I hit anything on this? Just fancy, just tap. It beeps. If we have a timeline right here, oh, it worked. And we're moving forward in time. We struggle because a lot of people ask, where did God come from? Who were God's parents? How is God so powerful? How old is God? That's when I get asked a lot. Well, it's very important to realize that God actually multiple times throughout Scripture would say that he is ancient days and he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and that he is without age. And... But God here is the creator of time. He is the... I need to short, make that a little bit smaller, see if I do that. He is the creator of... I'm going to use a science word here that we don't always talk about. Matter. And that he has the knowledge and the power to create heaven and earth. And that means then, how do I erase this? That God, is this the eraser? Nope, that's not the eraser. I'm working on it. I'm trying. God, oh, I messed up, is greater. I see it. I see this button. Shh. Hey, this is high tech for our church. Go this, this. God is greater than time, matter. What else did you see up there? Power, knowledge. If God is a creator of everything, that means God is above time, matter, power, and knowledge. Which leads us to a word that we sometimes look at. It is omni. Omni is a word that means all-powerful. You see, God is above time. He is above matter. He created it. He is above all knowledge, and he is all-powerful to do this. You see, that's, that's a lot of information. This makes God, therefore, omnipotent, which is in reference to... I got all my notes. We're done drawing, Jerry. That was scary. Uh, God is greater than this, and, and we sing this. God is omni, which is the Latin word meaning all. That is important that we remember this as we move along, that therefore 
God is omnipotent, meaning all-powerful. We are, and we'll get to this word in a second, monotheistic, believing in one God. Some people will try to make the belief system there are multiple gods and things that hold things into power. But God says, wait a second, in the beginning, God created. You would want a God who is beyond time, beyond matter, that it is greater than everything in order to create it. God is therefore omnipotent, which means I'm not uh, all powerful. And then we had omniscient, which means he's all knowing in order to create all things. He also knows both the past, the present, and the future, uh, he, which is why he is omnipresent, meaning that he is capable of being everywhere, all the time, in every place. See, this is the difference between the devil. The devil walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And the Bible tells us that David is over there saying, whether or not I can't get away from your presence if I go to the depths or out there, if I go to the heights, you're there. Uh, there's no place I can get away from you because you're omnipresent. You're everywhere. And then you could look in he, uh, Romans chapter 8 where once again it talks about love. And he says there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. No death, uh, no height, no, no, no passage. Nothing can because God is all powerful. And that is the God that we serve. The one true God who in the beginning created the heaven and the earth. We can struggle, uh, and it is very important. This is our belief structure. If you don't believe that God is omni, all-powerful, the amazing one that created the heaven and the earth in six days, how can you believe that he can forgive you of your sins? And then if you have a creator, you must believe then that he is the one who can set the law of what is sin against him and towards others. It is so important. Uh, another belief structure here that you get as you study the Genesis here is this concept that God is omni, God is therefore omnipresent. We talk about the all three omnis, and that makes God greater than. And we sing these songs, our God is greater, our God is stronger. We're like, oh, we do sing that song, don't we? Uh, there, uh, we talk about this, the God over all I know, and we sing all these different things. And then it was like, but when you put it that way, it kind of blows my mind that God is without origin because God has always existed. And it's also very important as we look at this that God has always existed. And we talked about this in Sunday school together in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And that three existing as one shows the eternal love that God has had. The eternal relationship that he has had. Which is why in John, when we read 1 John, it says, God is love. God has always existed within love of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Love has always abounded. Relationships has always abounded. Uh, this is an important word to our doctrine. If you go through our doctrinal statement, we believe there's only one God. How many gods do we believe? One. That's important. Say it with me. How many gods do we believe in? One. One. Uh, and you say, well, we sometimes pray in Jesus' name. We sometimes ask for presence in the uh, Holy Spirit to meet with us. And you realize the three are all equal and they're three in one. It's a whole other topic. And I should probably teach that one of these days. Uh, we must have this belief system in one God. Why is that so important? Because in today's world... They are trying to manipulate the structure that we can all have our own beliefs. You can believe in, in your God, and I'll believe in my God, and, and, and it's okay, and we should, we'll, we'll just get along. When you agree to that, you don't let God receive the glory for his creation. God says, there, there is no other God. There is one God, and it's me. I was a teenager, I started to enjoy Greek mythology. I don't know what it is about teenagers, they all seem to get fascinated somewhere around 14, 15 with Greek mythology, and, and, at least in my time, and didn't help that we were all reading Lord of the Rings and The Hobbits and all these other books and fantasy worlds, and Percy Jackson, Lightning Thief had just come out, and we're reading all these dorky things and, and enjoying things. But Greek mythology is 
messed up. Okay, uh, I don't know if you've ever looked into it, but it's some messed up stuff. Looking back at it, I'd be like, my dad should have smite me for reading that stuff. But uh, I, I was reading it and getting into it, and you're like, Zeus did what? And this guy stole fire, and this guy's over the sea, and this guy's over the sky, and this one's making people fall in love for, for fun, and this one's turning into an eagle and, and, and messing up marriages, and this one's doing this, and, and this belief system that there's a, a God over the sky, and a God over the land, and a God over the, the water, and a God over the storms and a God over the, the horses and things like this is what's called polytheism. And we are not polytheistic. We have one God. The book of Exodus confronts polytheism with the Egyptians and their multiple gods that they had. As they had a God of the Nile and a God of the sun and a God over the moon and a God of the frogs and a God over, over this and that and all these flies and lice and cattle. And, and, and God says, oh no, I'm going to show you that I'm God over everything. And I'm not just set to one region. I cover everything. And God confronts this over and over again. And when the Hebrew people go into the land of uh, the promised land, all these other gods are there. And it really, you think it's a, the battle of the people, but it's a battle of God showing that he is the one true God over all as he takes out nation after nation after nation, God after God. And if you go to 1 Samuel, and the 1 Samuel starts out very interesting. Samuel gets called, and there's this great battle, and there's this fat lazy priest called Eli, and he doesn't do what he's supposed to do, and the, the ark, the precious ark gets stolen because they take it into battle, and the Philistines take it, and they are mocking God, and they put it inside their temple, and, and the, this God, they come up the next morning, what do they do? They find this fish God laying down, and, and they find their people now having sores and pains, and they find all sorts of issues because God is showing, oh, no, no, I am God over all. And God is through all and in all, and it's very, very important that we have this belief system of one God, all-powerful, almighty, ancient of days, with knowledge to create the whole world and the universe, with the power to speak it into existence, and to remember that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him might not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. But God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us. God in his knowledge before the foundations of the world was laid. The lamb was was slain and was already known and had already happened and prepared for mankind to sin. You say, well, why did God allow it? God says, I, I, I'm going to give you a choice. And he does all of that before the foundation of the world was laid. Now, day one is so beautiful. I love this. Day one, I say light and darkness. As we read right here in this passage, it says this, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, and it was good, and God divided the darkness from the light. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. It is important for us to realize uh, a couple different things here. We sometimes mess up the days of the week here. And we say, oh, that's the sun. God created the sun. That's actually not the sun. The sun comes on day four. And it's important to realize there's a difference between the light and the sun because here we see God lets his light shine. In John chapter one, and I'm going to turn my Bible there, John chapter one, and if you're underlined, some of you are like, I mark my Bible. Some of you are like, I can't dare touch the Bible. I can't mark it. I get upset if the corners get pressed too hard. Uh, I underline and highlight and make personal notes all over my Bible. But it says this, in the beginning, John chapter 1, verse 1, which sounds a lot like in the beginning God created, was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, uh, the word was, with, word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. 
Then it gets into the story of John the Baptist right here. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same was a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It is important that we realize that the light became flesh. In God is light. As it says here, in him was life and the life was the light of men. With God being light, we are seeing that God allowed himself to shine forth. Here we see already in this passage that Jesus is called the light that came to dwelt among us. Our doctrinal statement refers to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and God. And in Genesis, you see that the Spirit moved upon the water. You see that God created. And here you see the light already. Jesus will go so far as to speak to them later on in John chapter 8. Uh, a few years ago, we looked at this statement when Jesus actually says, I am the light of the world, which upset the religious leaders so much because they would have memorized Genesis what we call chapter 1. And they would have said, no, God is the light of work. And in order for you to say that you are the light of the world, you are saying that you are God. And in order for you to be God, that means we should be worshiping you as, as God. And, and we refuse to do that. But let me tell you, Jesus was and is God in the flesh. We sing that song every single year, O come, O come, Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. I love that verse that uh, we were talking about it. He which knew no sin became sin. He left his home on high and dwelt among us in the form of man. He went to the cross 100% man and God in the flesh. Jesus declares himself uh, publicly in John chapter 8. Uh, I'm going to read it. He says, says, I'm the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came, whither I go, but you cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. And they're, they're very confused. And he says, you judge after the flesh, I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law, the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bears witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. When Genesis 1 is happening here and it says that God let his light shine, we see evidence already of Jesus Christ saying, I am God, and God existed in the flesh. Not say in the flesh, not yet, sorry. I got ahead of myself. God existed, Jesus Christ, God the Father, and uh, God the Holy Spirit were already there together. Which you say, why do we push coming to church so much? Why do we push coming to church and, and, and being together, and why do we want the believers together? Uh, Did you see that God had fellowship? Before he created the heavens and the earth, God already existed in three persons. You see, this is a lot of doctrine. It's a lot of information. We don't go over this stuff too often. This should be some Sunday school stuff. No, this needs to be back to the fundamentals of church because we have people walking out our doors at 17, 18, not believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God anymore. And they're following for every doctrine that is out there. Having itching ears and becoming wise. Believing in Asherah and Sophia's and all these other different names and different belief systems. And that we possibly came from aliens. Why? Because we don't emphasize this in our home that there's only one God. 
We don't emphasize that God is all-powerful. We don't live that God is all-powerful because if we lived that God was all-powerful, we would follow those verses and be like, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understandings. We would look at that and be like, be careful, be anxious, be anxious for nothing but in everything in prayer and supplication. Make your request be known to God and the God of peace that shall guard and comfort and keep your heart. We would actually put him in the right position. But instead we have gotten away from the belief that God created the heaven and the earth. That God is the light of the world. That God took darkness and turned it into order. Jesus publicly declared himself that he is the light of the world. And it is so important that we understand that in Christ, in God, is no darkness at all. Uh, eventually here, it got so warm, the ladybugs are coming to life. I just killed that little creature. In 1 John, it says that we ought to abide in the light. When we abide in Christ, we are a light. We are living in the presence of God, and God's glory comes upon us. We, We must live for this. A few other passages I'd like to look at is Revelation. In 1 John chapter 1 it says, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is the light, we have fellowship with one one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. Why do I say that this light is God's glory? Revelation chapter 22, verse 5 says this, about heaven. And some of you love talking about heaven. I love talking about heaven. I love talking all about the Bible, okay? So I'm good for any of the conversations. Heaven happens. And we love to talk about there's going to be no crying. There's going to be no sadness. I'm going to run. I'm going to walk up to my loved ones. I'm going to ask Jonah what it was like to be in the belly of a whale. All these different things. I've heard all the preaching on it and different things and topics. But Revelation 22 verse 5 gives us a little glimpse about heaven. That there will be no sun. There will be no moon. There will be no stars. It says, and there shall be no night there. And they need no candle. Neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. When God lets his glory shine, it is light. When Moses abided and was with God's presence for 40 days on the top of the mountain, when he came down, they had to cover his face because of the light of being in God's presence. Say, so what? I, where's that? Go do your research. Look, like, God, Moses had to cover his face because of God's light and the glory of God reflecting off him of being in his presence for those 40 days on the top of Mount Sinai. When Jesus was transfigured, there was light. Jesus is the light of the world. God's light shineth. And we, if you want to experience life, if you want to experience light, if you want to know what it's like to not have darkness in your life, if you want to know what it's like to be overcome with love, you need to be in Christ Jesus. I believe Brother Rich spent four to six weeks in his Sunday school class. We were talking a little bit, talking about abiding or uh, being in the vine and being in him. And and it comes to, uh, if you don't want to experience darkness, get in the light. You say, what is that? What do you mean by, by, by darkness? In him is life. In him is light. We must experience this. As we continue to go forward on day two, you say, day two? Wow, that was just day one, and that was just the beginning in day one. I don't know if we can handle day two. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth, and then we go, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament 
and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Now, the heaven is a term, and some people are like, so God created the heavens at this time. Uh, this is very interesting. Some people are like, is this the, the, the global and different belief structures, and there's all sorts of things. A lot of people would say that there was a, the canopy theory was developed. How many of you ever heard of the canopy? Anyone ever heard of it? Four, five, six. So what's the canopy? Uh, many people believe that God created a massive greenhouse effect before the flood. And, and the whole earth, because it never knew rain until the flood, in case you're wondering, that's going to be the catastrophe we're going to get to here in a couple, four weeks from now. Uh, the catastrophe, and, and we're going to see, uh, and there had never been rain. And those of you who study the greenhouse effect, or maybe even built one, we used to do this in science class, you get a glass jar, and you'd put some dirt in there, and a little bit of moisture, and you'd plant like a potato, or some sort of plant, and it would just continue to do this. And God created the permanence, the atmosphere, and everything that was needed. Because I don't know if you thought about this. What happens if we don't have an atmosphere? <laughs> Things go flying. We have to have it. And God created the, the atmosphere here. And God is showing his knowledge in the creation. But it's very important that you see this right here. And God said. God is so powerful that he spoke this into existence. God is so powerful that he thought and spoke this into existence. Why do we struggle with our daily sorrows? The last point of this message will eventually be the Sabbath, which is rest. Where Jesus will eventually say, Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, that you'll find rest. As we look at this passage, we see that God is so much bigger than us. And we're going to get there next week that we are made in his image. And it's very important that you realize you're made in his image and where you come from. But God being omniscient, omnipotent, all-powerful. And then we ask the question to you. Who do you go to when you're in problems? Who do you go to when you have issues? Wh wh where do you run to? Because God already declared himself in the first chapter, the first verse, as it as the head honcho, as the God. In the book of Isaiah, in the book of Ezekiel, there are multiple passages where God is just ridiculously coming after these statues and images and things. And he says, why are you worshiping this image that was carved from a tree that I made? I made the tree, but you're going to worship this. When we have heartaches, who do you go to? When you have problems, when you have issues, when the, the loved one passes away, when there's sickness in the family, when there's finances that don't make sense, when things are happening, where are you going to? When I was a kid, we had search engines. And we still have search engines, but it seems like there's only two out there now. Bing and Google. I'm sure there's someone here, hyper-conservative, that uses DuckDuckGo or something else like that. But anyone using DuckDuckGo? Yeah, I do hyper, yeah. Okay, I'm teasing you. But when I was a kid, we had this crazy one called Ask Jeeves. You remember that one? Yeah. And we would ask them the dumbest questions. You'd ask Jeeves. Uh, but uh, the, the results started coming out, the amount of people that would be like asking Jeeves for help with how to handle different things how to do this, how to do this, and be like, so I prayed to God, how do I make cookies? And I just waited for him to give him an answer. He's like, okay, I gave you the ability to read, to look up and, and to find some. But God's like, why wouldn't you come to me when you're hurting, when you're sorrowful, when you're full of anxiety? Because the Bible tells us, my grace is sufficient. God 
is enough. God is everything, and he wants to be there for you. As we just said, God already had a plan. God loved you. God saw this. And yet God said, later on, we'll look at this, let us make man in our image, that he created mankind only in his image. There is such a difference between all the animals, all the mammals, all the little fishes, all the little weird things you can't even see, all the little little weird mites that exist in our eyelashes and our fingers and eating the skin. You're like, I don't want to know about any of that stuff. And, and, and all the little things that are slowly breaking down our fabrics we don't even realize. And that's why you, when you go to the museum as a kid and they like, put your fabric underneath here and look at all these weird things that are crawling through everything. You're like, never again. And, and, and you don't want to know about this. But God says, I made all of that out there. But for you, I got down on the ground and I formed you out of the dust of the earth and I breathed life into you. Not just me, but the Bible says let us and we'll get there next week. If you would, let's bow our heads and close our eyes as we close out in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are so wonderful. You are so great. You are above all. You are through all. You are all powerful. You are almighty. You are above everything that we think we exist. And we thank you for, for putting us here. We thank you for giving us the, a, a little bit of ability of trying to comprehend how big you are. But we will never fully grasp the awesomeness, the amazing power and love that you have towards us. Father, we ask that we would be humble today in your presence, knowing that your presence is always with us and that it's everywhere and in all things and through all things. Father, we ask that if there is one in here that does not know Jesus Christ as the light of the world, as their Savior, that they have never walked with Christ, they've never accepted Christ, they've never sought repentance and, and, and a forgiveness of their sins, that today would be that day that they would say, I, I, I have sinned against God. Heavenly Father, we ask that there is one in here today that's struggling to say, man, I carry these things. I, I carry my burdens. I carry my problems. I carry my issues uh, like they're mine to carry and carry alone. And God is over here saying, I want you to give them to me. I can handle it. I made everything. I made everything good. I made everything perfect. And if you're hanging on to some of those issues, you're hanging on to some of that depression, some of that sorrow, some of that anger, some of that bitterness, some of that issues that you just don't want to let go of and you think you can take care of it yourself, today as you think about God... I need you to give it to him to let the healing happen. Because if you're struggling with that, you are walking in darkness and not in the light. Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with every heart in here, Lord, that they would continue to pursue after you. That they would come to know you personally. Father, we love you. We ask you to bless. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.